Man, but Jeff, I am uh, honored and privileged to be able to share space and time with you, my brother. So I was doing good before I got on the air, and now I'm doing even better. Yeah, hey, it's this is a this is a great thing to have you on here. I'm so privileged and honored to get a chance to have this conversation. I, I don't like to call these interviews anymore. I like to have to call these conversations and and just for you to enlighten us with the wisdom that you're about to. So much so, I felt so privileged that I had to step up my dress game. I had Dr. Wesley Muhammad on here and I, it was late at night and I was like, I know there's no way at eight o'clock at night Dr. Wesley is going to wear a suit, and sure enough, he did. So I figured if he did it, I knew you would. So I had to step it up just for you. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's out of respect, you know, and, and in particular, a lot of people uh, don't understand. There's, there's even a science behind the suit and the bow tie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a, as a general rule, anytime you see uh, someone in a suit and a bow tie, they're either doing one or two things, either they're serving or they are in a wedding, marrying mm -hmm. someone. So in that context, we wear the suit uh, and the bow tie because we are the servants of God and the servants of our people. So we want to present ourselves uh, to our people as their servant. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, the same vows that a bride and groom takes to one another, we believe from the guidance of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, we should have that same kind of spirit and take those same vows when it comes to the mission of the resurrection, restoration, and redemption of our people. So, you know, we, we look like grooms and servants. And of course, too, you know, the bow tie also is uh, it's a part of our war drove. Mm -hmm. <laughs> War, bro. I caught it. I definitely yeah, caught that. <laughs> you, whenever you are in guerrilla warfare and you have to establish a beachhead behind enemy lines, you have to dress like the dominant figure of that environment if you want to camouflage and maneuver uh, without being being observed as easy. So they wear suits, so we wear suits. And then, mm. too, uh, we generally wear a bow tie and it has a clip on it. Because if we in a physical conflict, if I had my tie on a certain way, someone could reach behind it, pull it and turn my tie into a noose. Mm. But if you reach for this bow tie, you'll walk away with a handful of bow tie and a mouthful of fist. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> yeah, that, that, That's just part of it. But the big thing is it's out of our respect uh, for the platform that, uh, that that God has blessed you with and out of respect for your audience. And we want our people to know we serve them. And we are here through rich or poor, better or worse, in sickness and in health till death do us part. I love that. I love that. Once again, we're talking to Brother Nuri Muhammad. He is about to, if you don't, if you've never heard this man speak, you are in for a treat tonight. Just be sure to share and hit the like button because it is going to be a great thing. Now, Brother Nuri, before we get started, now we're going to have a lot of relationship talk. Before we get into that, I want to ask you, how did you know, just from what I, I've, I've read a lot, listened to a lot of your interviews, read some of the articles about you, read your bio. How did kind of a young street hustler from the streets of Indianapolis, Indiana, become student minister Nuri Muhammad? Oh, man, but but Jeff, it was accidentally on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but you you know how you know how we open up our conversation. What had happened was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make a short what had happened was, uh, you know, I was young meddling in the streets and I didn't like the way I felt uh, hustling. I, I felt the love in me for what I should love and my own really my own humanity dying as I was killing my people. So I didn't like the way I felt, so I wanted to quit and I did. And the only thing that I knew to get right uh, is to go to church. So I started going to church with uh, one of my associates in the neighborhood and his father was an assistant pastor and they had me going to everything. I was Bible studying, two <laughs> services on Sunday. What, what, I mean, I was doing it all. I was mm. at every meeting. But I still didn't feel like I was getting the, I had the strength to resist the pull of the streets. And uh, anybody that's ever been 
uh, hustling on any on any level where they were getting any real money, you know it's just as hard to stop selling as it is to stop using. Mm. One's addicted to the drug, the other's addicted to the money and what the money can do for you when you get it. So, you know, I was an addict and didn't know it. So at church, I didn't feel that pull uh, to pull me away from the inclination of wrongdoing again. And my girlfriend at the time, father, was a supporter of the nation, had a lot of lectures and books. She started reading and studying, had already been listening to the minister ever since she was four. Mm. We were only 16. And she laid two lectures by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in a book called Message to the Black Man, Rocked My World. <laughs> and I said, this is, this is how I've been believing all of my life. I just didn't know how to say it like this. Mm -hmm. But from the outside looking in, you know, it looked, this looked way too strict for me. I was like, oh, man, I, I think I'll join, but I'm waiting till I'm about 73. <laughs> wait till I get a little. And, and, and then I, I, I made a pledge to myself as a teenager. I said, if you can prove it to be wrong, you'll leave it alone. But if you can't prove it wrong, you'll submit yourself to it 100 percent. So I was spending eight, nine, ten hours a day studying, uh, learning the teachings, but also trying to see if I could find something wrong with it. And uh, my little argument that I would take eight hours for five days straight, I bring it to one of the brothers mm -hmm. who wasn't even in leadership lay out my whole exegesis of why this can't be and in five minutes they shut me down <laughs> and uh so you know as time went on um uh, i knew that i couldn't prove it to be wrong and i knew that the scales had been removed from my eyes and i was becoming uh a, a resurrected man and operating in what i felt like i had power so I knew, I knew it was the truth and submitted to it. And uh, I guess because I studied so much, Brother Jeff, that when we had our meetings that we could talk, my, my statements had substance to it. So people were always pushing to put that brother on the rostrum. Mm. And I told him, man, I ain't, I ain't come here to be on the <laughs> rostrum. I told him, I said, I don't want to be in no leadership. And I don't want to be in no ministry. I came to be a soldier. And I told, I told him, I told him, I said, y'all never catch me in no dress shoes. <laughs> I said, I'll be, every time you see me, I'm going to be in some soldier in boots. I want to be a soldier. And they's like, well, you can be a soldier too. And they put me on the roster. And I spoke, people were standing and clapping. I thought they just was being nice to this little teenage 17 year old little brother that just joined the mosque. Lo and behold, they were really sincere, mm -hmm. uh, clapping and applauding and, uh, they end up keeping me up there and I end up becoming at a, as a teenager an assistant minister. And uh, I end up being made the minister here uh, by, by the minister when I was, I was the interim minister before I even turned 21. Wow. And, and became, we end, we end up in about six months, we doubled in ranks from me when I was the, uh, interim minister so mm -hmm. i became the minister and we were the most outstanding study group most outstanding mosque most improved mosque all kind of accolades but that's that's you know in a nutshell that's how this became a reality in my life it wasn't something that i was looking for i wouldn't put myself in the category of jonah in the belly of the fish <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't on that level but i didn't want the responsibility uh nor that i want i felt like it's insincere if you want to be in leadership something's wrong with you you should want to be a servant mm -hmm. and if it happens it happens so it happened that's awesome that's an awesome story brother neri and and it's a good thing i know the people the great people of indianapolis are happy that you're there and people across this country and across the world are happy that you're in the position that you are now in uh but we are here today tonight to talk about black love and black relationships and you talked about yeah. in that story about how at 16 years old there was a your then girlfriend yeah. introduced you to the nation and for some who don't know that then girlfriend ended up becoming your lovely wife and 
so you have so from 16 to now you have a pretty good understanding of black love and black relationships brother nuri when you hear the words black and love together what what does that mean what if somebody says that what what's kind of is that vision to you man that is a very good question and you know of course that you know what a blessing it is uh to be able to break that that rule and i you know i me and my wife we were together when we were 14 years old in junior high school wow <laughs> so you know she remembered the actual date that we start calling each other girlfriends and boyfriends <laughs> and i guess that meant that she had some uh awareness in her mind consciousness that we was gonna make it uh, <laughs> but we uh you know my then girlfriend became uh, my now wife but but i will say this don't try that at home <laughs> Mm. Don't, don't you try that, <laughs> little young brother, little young sister. There's a uh, there's a, a website and an organization. I don't know the name of the organization, but their website is called abstinence uh, .com. and it's a it's a it's a website and an organization that tries to promote young people keeping their discipline sexually and keeping their virtue and wait until they get married uh, before they start interacting with the opposite sex on a physical level. I thought that's a good site, but on it, there's a study that they did where they found that almost 99% of all high school sweethearts never make it to being husbands and wives. So that's wow. not, you know, it happened. We was, we was able to crack into that little 1%. <laughs> 1%. <laughs> you know, and I'm thankful, uh, for that, but it's not something you should try at home. Black, when most people see the term black, uh, unconsciously we see it in a negative light. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the, the way that it's been used in language. If you look in the dictionary uh, under the term black, there's 120 definitions, all of them are negative. Mm. But you look in the dictionary under the word white there's 134 definitions and almost all of them are positive pure clean innocent holy but you go to black as in you know you and my brother y'all were on the line if y'all wouldn't have made it y'all would have been blackballed <laughs> look at that whenever mm. you're having bad luck you're behind the eight ball the black ball the last mm. ball to go in you know, the stock market crashed. It was called Black Monday. You're telling a little bitty lie, a little white lie, but you're telling a deliberate lie, it's a black lie. Mm. Think of the, so, so the math of black as a general statement has a negative connotation to it. The conscious community, uh, a lot of times we use black and it only is a description of skin color, but black is not just color. Black is also consciousness and it's also a connection to the creator. Mm. So when I think in terms of black, period, I think color, consciousness and connection to creator. Black love is that kind of love that grows out of the color of your spouse, your spouse, the same as yours conscious meaning you care about your people and the rise of your people and you have a connection to the creator in the sense that you are moral and you are trying to please god that's the that's my uh little take on what black loves mean means to me whenever i hear the statement awesome awesome brother muhammad uh, that that is a great way to put it and that's a great way to start because you talked, we're talking about black love and black relationships and you gave a keynote at the all black national convention this year. And yes, you sir. spoke about, you broke down some statistics. One of those statistics were, was, you know, a long time ago that it would be 90% of black yeah. marriages and they, in almost a hundred percent of those 90% of black marriages would last. And yeah. those statistics, it went to from 90% of black on black marriages to 40%. Just right. can you can you break down some of that and and what do you think yeah. are some of those the causes 
to to the lack of black marriages that take place now? Well, it of course it it, it did help that we it was against the law to marry white women. Yes, that's very men. true. It that's did very help. True. <laughs> it did it did help that we were being lynched from looking under a white woman's dress while it hung on a clothesline. Mm. But what there was a uh, 2015 McKinley Irvin family law study where they went and looked at 1867, two years up from slavery, so-called Emancipation Proclamation. Oh, another show, though. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because you know, emancipate doesn't mean free. That's why they didn't call it the freedom of slave. The word emancipate comes from the Latin word emancipere, which means to free from the hand, but not from the control. Mm. So once you got uh, uh, certain commands installed into the psyche of a people, you don't have to regulate their hands and their feet anymore because every voluntary act of the human body must first start off as a thought. And then the thought is what encourages the body to engage in the appropriate muscular activity that matches the nature of itself. So once the thought, once the mind is locked up, you don't have to worry about the hands and the feet because the hands don't move if the mind don't tell it, the feet don't kick if the mind doesn't tell it, et cetera. But in 1867, they found that out of eligible adults, black adults that could be married, 90% of all black adults were married to a black man or a black woman, and they had a near 100% success ratio. 2015, there was only 40% of black adults that could be married actually being married, and they have a 75% divorce rate. So if you've got 40%, that's four out of 10. And if you've got a 75% divorce rate on top of that four, that means for every three couples or four couples you see, three of them are not gonna make it. So only one out of 10 will survive to meet the word that they gave to death, do us part. Wow. So part of it, uh, of course, was that, you know, number one, we we had to uh, unite with each other in order to survive. And it was against the law for us to even look at a white woman. You could be you could literally not just be incarcerated. You could be lynched for a crime called reckless eyeballing. Wow. And when you had were charged with reckless eyeballing, the slave master's children would come and grab you and lynch you for looking at a white woman too long. So mm. part of it, you know, that that fact that we were uh, connected to with our own woman as the only option and our own man as the only option. And um, we were not. How can I say this? We were in Africa and we had become strong. We was there living and conquering the jungle for 50,000 years. And we inherited a certain amount of resilience that allowed us to be able to endure the suffering of slavery. Mm -hmm. Slavery imposed a whole nother level of treachery on us. And then the next generations they were able to have that genetic resilience to be able to survive in the recent years up from slavery. But now it appears as though that resilience, that strength, that fortitude that we once have is now beginning to wear off and we're not as strong uh, as we used to be. So we, I don't know how to say it, but we punk out too much. <laughs> We punk out too much on everything, including marriage itself. So we have that pattern now of, of giving in when, when, when struggle shows up. We have the, the most damnable disease that's killing black people is not high blood pressure, diabetes, or, or AIDS or cancer. It's excusitis. <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> Brother Jeff, is even integrated and transferred over into the category of black love then mm. when we put our word out there because we were still somewhat connected to the genetic memory of our god-centered african culture where we said my word is bond and bond is life mm -hmm. and i shall give my life before my word shall fail so when we gave our word that i will be your husband and i will be your wife 
through rich or poor, better or worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Our word was bond. Mm. But now, with excuse-itis, with this high level of punking out on everything, with the loss of resilience, our word is not bond no more. Our word has become blonde. And blonde is mm. weak, recessive. So we, we mm. got to get back and return to our core system of values where we knew that the family unit was really our power base. And when we knew it, we behaved like it and we executed, invented and built civilization. Now today, we don't see it like that. And we are the subject of, of being the number one consumers, but not producers. We are employees, but not employers. We work somewhere, but we own very little of anything. We have $1.3 trillion in income, but still only get, have 1% of the wealth of this country. Mm. That's fast, awkward, brother Jeff. You didn't, care, you didn't care. I, I caught it. Trust me, I did. I definitely did. You, you're a lot more poetic with your words than no, I am, no. but I definitely caught it for sure. Once again, we're talking to student minister, Brother Neri Muhammad. Be sure to hit the thumbs up button, like, share, subscribe, because we are talking about black love and black relationships. Now, Brother Neri, you talked about love, not your word, not being bond but being blonde. And what that made me think of was something that you spoke about during your keynote about this thing that you called Beckery. <laughs> if you could please explain to the audience what exactly is Beckery and what do you think that's, that's doing to our community? Wow. Well, you know what? Anybody that remembers the, the song Lemonade by Beyonce when you <laughs> talked about Becky with the good hair. You know, it sounded like she was talking about a white girl sliding in and on her on her man. So Beckery, I, I was making a, a, a joke. You know, I was joking, but serious <laughs> about how every so often they present to the ICD-9 book, which is a book of symptoms to determine what a new condition is going to be, that they're going to be able to diagnose and treat and prescribe, whatever. And I said, I wanted to introduce a new 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 condition. <laughs> To the book when since they're doing it it's called beckery <laughs> what is beckery beckery is the mental and the psychological uh, ca uh mental and, and psychological castration of a black man as a direct result of a long-term relationship with a white woman Oof. And now, brother, Neri, you're not gonna make a lot of friends and stuff like that. But continue. <laughs> but, but if if we if we all you have to do is see the honorable Elijah Muhammad said this. He said, out of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward the researcher. Scripturally, look at the story of Samson and Delilah. Delilah was a Philistine, and Samson was a black man. He had locks. And they had tried to defeat this man all the years that he was winning as a warrior. They sent whole armies after him, couldn't break him, couldn't beat him. And so their, their last trick, their last trick was to send a Philistine woman in to see if she can get close to him and break him. Philistine people are Caucasian. Next thing you know, you start hearing about Samson's locks being cut off and he had lost his strength. And ask any black woman, can they spot a black man that's with a white woman, even if the white woman's not present? And I guarantee you they'll tell you yes. You know why? Because as a general rule, they're a little softer, a little more punctified. They're not as masculine as they should be or would be if they was with that queen. So we were we were breaking it down, showing that, you know, whenever Napoleon was hired in the mid 1800s, he was hired by the king of England and other European rulers to go into Africa and destroy all of the images of black excellence. So he was getting rid of any image of the disciples that were black, Jesus, black, Mary, black prophets that were black, angels that were black, and any signs of black excellence. And one of the things that he did was when he found that great pyramid Giza in Egypt, which 
is 451 feet tall and 451 feet deep, covering 13 and a half acres of land made of 1 million stones of gold, granite, and marble stacked mathematically precise east to west, north to south, up in the air, down into the earth, and we built it without John Deere or Caterpillar. We didn't mm. even have a bulldozer. It was the power of the mind. Telepathy did. That's how powerful we were. Mm. So after he went into the, the pyramids, he noticed that the great images of what would be considered the gods, Os uh, Osiris, Alephum, the, the great uh, uh, gods, Ase As Asa, every time they seen Osiris, Isis was with him. Every time they seen Asa, Aset was with him. Every time they seen the great god male, Alephum, Ilida was right by our side. So when you go into the pyramid now, you can still see uh, uh, Alephum, you can still see Osa, you can still see Osiris, but next to them, somebody scraped away the image. And that image that they scraped away was them being with that black queen. Why? Napoleon knew that he could not allow a message to be sent down the line of time that not behind, but beside every strong black man has always been a strong black woman. So mm. we want to try to, he, he was trying to start the disease of Beckery way back then. <laughs> Here we are in 2021 and it's become full blown. Mm. Mm. Once again, we're talking to Brother Nuri Muhammad. If you haven't noticed by now, the man's on fire and we're just getting started. Now, Brother Nuri, I, I heard there was a saying that I heard once. I first heard it from Brother Ben X and he it was from Minister Louis Farrakhan. He said, romance without finance is a nuisance. And I heard you say the same thing. And you you and I was like. My mind was blown when I had first heard it. And then I, it was blown even more when I heard it the second time. For our audience, what does that mean? And why is that so important? Yeah, well, that's one of them old sayings. I, I call it from the gospel of Big Mom. <laughs> you know, we might have learned it from the minister, but it's an old saying that we had. And, and uh, you know, that I, when I say the gospel of Big Mama, pe people know what I'm talking about. Mm. <laughs> it's some stuff that Big Mama said is just as true as what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John said. Birds of a feather flock, flock together. together. <laughs> that, that's not the Bible. That's Big Mama. <laughs> you lie down with dogs, you're going to get up with fleas. Mm -hmm. A family that prays together. Stays stay, together. Stays together. <laughs> Wise men learn from others' mistakes. Fools learn from their own. No. You know, a woman will either make you or break you. That's not mm. Quran. That's Big Mama that said that. <laughs> So it's some stuff Big Mama didn't put out, you know, and one of them was romance. Without finance is a nuisance. Why mm. is it? Because the nature of a woman is to put demands on the nature of a man. And the nature of a man is to, to put demands on the nature of the woman. And when you unpack the variables of the scriptures of the Old Testament, New Testament, or the Holy Quran, no matter which one you look at, it says by nature, man is maintainer, protector, provider, and woman by nature is help me, comfort, and consoler to her man. So anytime that you have romance and there's no finance, how can you maintain? Mm. How can you provide? And if you've got maintain, protect, and provide as the three universal codes that you find in the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Holy Quran as the nature and natural function of a man, then, then at best, all he can do is protect. But he's missing the two other primary ingredients if he doesn't have any finance, because without finance, you cannot provide. Without mm. finance, you cannot maintain. So it becomes a nuisance because it is the nature of a woman to put a demand on the nature of her man. And she's going to want and desire, not, not because she is, you know, as they say, high maintenance or, or whatever, but it's the nature of a female. She wants to be made secure and she becomes secure when that man is a maintainer, protector and a provider. And without finance, without money, 
you're not going to be able to fulfill maintenance and provision. So it becomes a nuisance. Mm. That That's where the nuisance uh, uh, becomes. It wasn't a saying that men came up with. This was a saying that came from women based upon life experience. I then got connected to a man. He don't have no money, no <laughs> know-how, no will. He's non-productive. Therefore, he's a nuisance. Mm. And no woman wants to be with a full-grown boy. Mm. Every woman wants to be with a man. And when you put a diamond on the finger of a woman, she's excited. But the real thing she wants more than a diamond on her hand is to be holding hands with a man that has become a diamond among men. And you can't be a diamond among men unless you know how to hunt unless you are a go-getter, unless you know how to go out and conquer matter, energy, space, and time and bring back material reward to build a legacy for your family. Wow, absolutely, absolutely, Brother Hamid. That, that was the perfect perfect definition to that, to that very, very great saying by Big Mama. <laughs> now, now, Brother Muhammad, now I want to, but what about this? I want to pose to you this, though. There are a lot of women... Who say that they're independent? Who say, what What do you say to those women like, I can make my own money. I may not need a man. I can do this. There's a lot of independent women out there to that and, and say like, hey, you know, I don't always need a man to, to be my best. What, right. what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, it, it, it is true. Um, and, and it is a survival mechanism at, at this point. And I would I would be crazy to tell a woman, you know what? Don't even worry about it. Just wait around for you to meet a good man. As soon as you meet the good man, you can start having the things in life that you desire. But until then, just sit around and be <laughs> poor, broke, hungry, naked, out of doors with nothing, doing nothing, just waiting on a man. No, you, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that, that the woman, the black woman in particular, should be free to do anything that her heart desires and she can do anything in the way of righteousness without violating her nature that a man can do. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing wrong with you being like that uh, and being productive in Islam. Whenever a man marries a woman, it is customary that the man brings a gift of something monetary, either cash or something that has a cash value and gives that to his new wife as what they call a dowry. And in, in Islam, whenever you marry a woman, what's hers remains hers. You don't get none of it. But what's mm. yours becomes hers too. So mm. it's nothing wrong with you having that spirit. Uh, it's just whenever you are in that zone and it's out of a compensation uh for the non-productive man uh that you're with and and i think that that you would be wise as a woman if you know that romance without finance is going to become a nuisance if that man doesn't have the skill set to go out and maintain protect and provide then he's not worthy uh, of becoming your husband yet until he gets to that status. If not, you know, you're going to be married to a man, but you're going to be treating him uh, in your mind. You will lose respect for him. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, you're going to, it's going to really upset the balance of, of the home because he's going to, he's see the language of a man is honor. Mm -hmm. And the language of a woman is security. She wants to feel secure emotionally, mentally, physically, and financially. She wants to feel secure. Mm -hmm. But the nature of a man is honor. And when that man is a non-productive man, he won't receive honor from his, his mate. And at a certain point, it's going to serve as a means of weakening the man even more. And he's not going to be loyal. Uh, to you, he's going to be gone. So no, sisters, I understand, you know, it is a unfortunate 
circumstance and and it's not by accident it's by design mm. i encourage all of the viewers to google the willie lynch letter and google the let us make a slave document that comes from that letter of willie lynch and look at the particular chapter or section on the breaking of the nigger female mm. and when you look at what he says he says in paraphrasing that make her to be independent of her man by doing so you will put her into listen to this he said a frozen psychological state wow where she will begin to train her offspring to be as you would make them if you were their parent talking about slave masters mm -hmm. so ch check it out they know that that's not the nature of things the woman is not born and created by god to handle an undue amount of stress and the minute that you become so independent that you have to become maintainer protector provider and comfort and consoler and homemaker and mother when you have to do all of that you are putting yourself under too much stress and pressure you're weighing other than your own self psychologically it's only a matter of time before it destroys you uh health wise and emotionally so it's it's not a good system but i understand it for survival be as you have to be but encourage that man to be as he should be and when he gets to that point where he is that hunter and that go-getter and he is able to do for you and your family then let that stress go and let him carry that burden smile and live a stress-free existence because you got a good man that knows how to take care of you absolutely absolutely once again we're talking to brother nuri muhammad and now brother muhammad you have a series of books now one of those books is titled before i say i do what yeah. are some of the things that you suggest to flourishing couples that are dating that you would advise some of the things they should think about or maybe even consider before they say i do well that that's a very good question and and this book is before you say i do this book is really designed to assist really a black man and a black woman on mm -hmm. proper mate selection mm. um, if you notice rich white people always marry rich white people it's very true and and the reason that you see families marrying similar families among the asians the jews and caucasians is because they are trying to keep a certain breed or a certain species of their people alive so they are very selective it's the same as it is with the dogs the horses you you don't you don't mate uh different breeds of dogs with with one another you don't mate uh different kinds of horses you have a a horse that is for carrying uh, a, a wagon or 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 one that's a race stallion you marry stallion you put stallions with stallions mm -hmm. so mate selection you know is so important in fact i must step out of here and say this brother jeff outside of belief in god choosing the right mate is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life wow because when you when you choose a mate either that mate will inspire you to grow into your greatness or they'll confine you to complacency they'll either be your other half or they'll make you half of yourself mm. the minister said this one time he said a good mate brings out the best in you and makes you more youthful and a bad mate brings out the worst in you and causes you to age prematurely so choosing a mate is is the most important decision other than belief in god you ever going to make why that's why mm. so phase one remember brothers and sisters what is marriage called it's called holy matrimony it's called a sacred union or in some writings they call marriage a covenant connection covenant connection sacred union and holy matrimony 
these are all spiritual terms. Mm -hmm. So when you are going to choose a mate, you should be looking more at spiritual and mental characteristics than you are looking at physical characteristics. And one of the things that we learned is that, see, before we were kidnapped and Caucasianized and Westernized, there was no such thing as dating among mm. black people. Mm, I didn't know that. We courted. We we courted one another. Even have you ever seen The Godfather? I have. You you do know you know we don't have time to go into it, but the Spanish or the Italians. Italians. Mm -hmm. The Italians adopted many of the customs of the Moors, which were African Muslims that conquered Spain and went into Italy. Mm. So a lot of their habits that you see among the Italians are very similar to Muslims. We greet each other cheek to cheek. They greet each mm -hmm. other cheek to cheek. They, they have brotherhood. They don't discuss certain things at the, at the, at the dinner table. It's, it's about uh, family. But you remember in The Godfather that when Michael was in Sicily and he was interested in a female, they went out walking with each other. But when the camera panned up behind them, you know, 100 feet away, was that, that little girl's whole family was out there. There's about 15 deep. <laughs> <laughs> they learned that from our African customs. We did not believe that we should ever engage in physical contact with one another until we were married. And that any time that we were even alone with the opposite sex, we would have a chaperone uh, with us to make sure that we didn't get too excited, too physically attractive attracted to one another and then end up engaging in premarital sex. Sex, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, has a blinding quality to it. Mm. It floods the brain with so many chemicals, the serotonin, the endorphins, the adrenaline, and the dopamine that the brain is flooded with being sexually active is so strong that it begins to really corrupt the, the prefrontal cortex, which is the cent the place in the brain that deals with judgment. Mm. So once the judgment centers of the brain have become, for the lack of a better word, distracted and distorted, <laughs> now you can't even see the negative spiritual or psychological, mental or personality traits anymore because you're too infatuated with the physical. Mm. So we, in picking that mate, say don't date court. Dating is just two people involved with each other and whatever happens, happens. But courting is when two people are only communicating with each other because in their mind they have, at some point, finding someone that they're going to marry and they're not going to be physical till that, that point. I know this sounds rough and strict. <laughs> it's real rough and strict. You, know, you think about I think you, you you think about people talking about how hard it was to have Steve Harvey put out something called a ninety day rule. Oh Lord, how we <laughs> No, nah, but if you really if you really want to be serious and you want to have what you're looking for, which is that happily ever after, you got to do it right. You mm. can't take the wrong road and expect to end up in the right place. That's the way it goes. Mm. So that that became uh, an issue. And, and what happened, Brother Jeff, is that talking to people all over the country, we were being invited to speak by all different kinds of people at different sets. But almost always the freedom fighters, the revolutionaries, the activists that brought us in, they always had domestic or relationship problems. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, do you know when, do you know your, your, your home is supposed to be your spiritual recharge center? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be the place that you unplug from this wicked white supremacist world and you can come home, let your guard down and come to an environment where you can plug into a pure source of love and extract peace and power from your home. But man, if a man or a woman is out fighting for their people, fighting to make a living, and then they come home and they got to fight again. 
how are they ever going to have the energy on either side to perform well for freeing the people, well for building the business, or well for each other as husbands, fathers, and mothers and fathers. So I kind of uh, really was tired of having these little sidebar meetings all the time. <laughs> so I said, let me see if I can come up with something that can help stop this a little bit and help it. And I did before you say I do. And then we kept going and then everybody said, well, I'm already married. I still want to talk to you. I was like, I got to do another after you say I do. <laughs> so now I got both before and after you say I do. And I just say, look, take two of these and call me in the morning. <laughs> like aspirin. <laughs> like, 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 old doctors used to say, yeah. going door to door with them little leather bags. I say, take two of these. <laughs> so far, we haven't had anybody really come, call back because they've been uh, pretty good guys in helping mate selection and then really helping to uh, practice what I call courtship after marriage, mm. which is also uh, a system that keeps things going and alive that's in the after you say I do book. That's awesome. You can find both of Dr. Nuri, I mean, of Brother Nuri, not Dr. Brother Nuri Muhammad's books. You sound like a doctor. That's why I was wow, like, wow. man, you, you're prescribing the right medicine right there at NuriMuhammad.com. Right there at NuriMuhammad.com. Now, Brother Nuri, I don't want to keep you all night, but I do have just a few more questions. I yes, want sir. to, Hi. I do want to ask you, you, I want to backtrack a bit. You spoke about, you spoke about, well, I wanted to ask you about interracial relationships. We're talking about black love. We're talking about black marriages. We're talking about black, you know, being together, black relationships. But there is an influx of interracial relationships that take place with particularly for the black man. Let's really let's call the brothers out because it's really happening. Sisters happen, yeah, but it's really the brothers. What What do you think? Is that is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that I, I'm more of an advocate of. I feel like black men should devote themselves to black women, but I, um, but you know, I don't judge the guys that do otherwise, but what what are kind of your thoughts on the interracial relationship thing? Well, we don't believe in it. You know, the honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, was taught by God that, and, and common sense tells us anytime that you are with someone that you call your spouse, you call them your mate. Mm -hmm. Well, go in your closet and pick up a red Reebok. Go in your closet and pick up a pair of white Air Force Ones. Go in your closet and pick up some Concord 11s. If you have one Concord 11 in your hand and you and you go to the closet or somebody goes to the closet and comes back out with a red Air Force One, say, here you go. You say, no, this ain't the mate that goes to this shoe. Why? Because it doesn't look like. <laughs> it has to be the counterpart of it has to be the match to it has to be the mate of so that should be a criterion in mate selection the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan did say this though he said love can transcend color he said however the problem with us is that we did not choose a white woman instead of a black woman out of love we chose it out of that out of a sickness where we feel closer to our slave master therefore we feel successful hmm. we actually believe and you look back and as we gave the example of in the beginning why was it easier for us to stay married with to a black woman or a black woman to a black man and it's because they wouldn't allow us to even look at a white woman's dress while it hung on the clothesline let alone be, you know, looking at a, a white woman or being in a relationship, you can get lynched for reckless eyeballing. Well, look at what happened to us. Do you know that Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the early 1900s was not the only place in America where there was independent black economics operating? There was Rosewood, there was other places. Mm -hmm. The reason we had our own dry cleaners, banks, grocery stores, bus lines, hotels, restaurants is because white people would not let us in theirs. So because they would not let us in theirs because of segregation, 
Mm-hmm. We were forced to build for our own, and we didn't just survive, we thrived mm-hmm. doing for self. But the minute that Negroes start going into the sitting at the bar stools and getting spit in a food rate water holes and beat you know i want to sit on the toilet next to white people <laughs> i want to get drunk next to white people i want to sleep in a little nasty hotel room next to some nasty white people the minute that they said all right you negros can now start eating with us coming to our movie theaters you can start going to our cleaners our grocery stores and sleep in our hotels and ride on our buses guess what happened our hotels busted. All the black businesses went away. So, mm-hmm. so integration with white people meant disintegration of black power in the sense of economics. Turn that into this whenever you have black men running with another woman. Integration ends up becoming disintegration of the power base of black people, which is the black family. So mm-hmm. it, it, it is not that love can't transcend color, but what made you like them enough to choose them over someone that looks like you and came from the same life experience? I said, and even if you don't want to get into the Quran or the Bible in the story of Samson uh, and Delilah, your mama's a black woman. How are you going to watch her suffer and struggle all those years trying to do for you? And then you want to pick somebody that looks opposite uh, of her. Brother Jeff, the black woman has been the most loyal woman to her man more than any other woman of any other nationality, race or group of people on the face of this earth. She deserves to be maintained, protected and provided for. We owe her a debt to look out for her and make sure we take care of her like she's been taking care of us all of these years. So that system uh, of doing it, and I'm saying that that if you have already made a commitment uh, to someone, I'm not telling anyone, and we don't promote that from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, if you made marriage vows, we're not going to tell you just go get a divorce. Mm -hmm. No, if you've already committed, then you should, should honor your vows. But I will say that in order for you to reach your full potential as a black man, you're going to need that precious black woman with you to help bring out the best in you where you can reach your full potential. Wow. Wow. Once again, this is this is why we have Brother Nuri Muhammad on. He, he drops the gems. He gives the facts. This is what we love to hear. Uh, be sure to hit the thumbs up button and share this video. This needs to be seen by as many people as possible because we love what the student minister, Brother Nuri Muhammad, is saying right now you're giving a sermon i feel like i'm in church right now so i i see what the the good folks in indianapolis what moss number 74 correct yes, moss yes, number 74 i see what they get each and every week each and every day because this is this is amazing now brother neri i'm gonna get you out on this uh, i want to say now during your keynote you, you spoke about how black men and black women want to be loved differently. Uh, I'm not going to tell you to to give that whole 45 minute speech. If you want to go see that, we have that at allblackdigital.com. That's allblackdigital.com. But what just, if you can just some summarize that just a bit about how black men and black women love to be loved or respected or loved in different ways just kind of if you can just i know you i know it's, it's gonna be hard but just kind of summarize that in a bit uh we don't have to get the whole acronym but just a little yeah, how they yeah. how they like to be loved and respected in different ways thank you but jeff well you know i i learned this from from the minister uh once there's a there is gender specific commands from god on how a black man can get the best out of his woman and how the woman can get the best out of her man. And even though we are two twin halves of a single essence, as the Quran says, we are different in the way that we receive and the way we are communicated with when it comes to love. Mm -hmm. You have some people that wrote a book, they call it the four love languages. Um, I don't know how accurate that is, but I know 
that in Ephesians 5 33 there there's a verse that says this and men should love their wives as they love themselves and women should respect their husbands mm. i said wait a minute why <laughs> why did it say love when man to woman but respect from woman to man as you heard me say earlier the language of a man is honor so we uh in that message called how to love a black woman how to love a black man we went through what it means to love and what it means to respect so in the context of love they did a study in 2012 on the today show where they interviewed women all over the world to find out what is it that they were looking for in a man different groups of people different nationalities all over the earth and they they kind of consolidated it into four basic ingredients that all women were looking for in their men and one was loyalty two was to love three was to labor meaning they wanted a hard-working man mm -hmm. four was to listen so loyal and you know that as a general rule women are one man one women but men have not been one woman men so they were looking for somebody that, as Kendrick Lamar and Rihanna said, had some loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. <laughs> and then they wanted someone that would love them, labor for them, and uh, listen to them. And the fifth thing that they said was laughter had a sense of humor made them laugh. And we mm -hmm. added to it. You don't want to, You can't just be no good man to a woman if you know how to listen, make her laugh you labor and you 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 know you you know how to love and you loyal the minister said this he said a ignorant man will never be a good husband to a woman so you also have to be a learned man you got to be learned you got to be smart mm -hmm. too so that kind of a breakdown um is is what makes love from a man to a woman bring out the best in her mm -hmm. and then respect we took respect and broke it down into an acronym and the acronym is when every letter in a word represents another word like CIA, the cocaine import agency and FBI find a black man to incarcerate media, most effective devil in America. You understand what I mean? <laughs> respect. So the R, uh, we're not going to break it all down, but R stands for respect itself. Show honor to, to, to your man. Respect him. Show show him that you that you have a sense of uh, dignity in looking up to and admi you admire him. E stands for esteem, and esteem is a little different than worth. When someone has self worth, that means what they think about themselves based off of what God said about them and what they see in the mirror. But self esteem is what you think about yourself based off of how other people see you. So if you're going to esteem a man, you have to show him honor and respect in front of people that he honors and respect. And then the S, uh, we broke it down as it st stood for uh, his sight. Stay beautiful. Smile. Smile at that, that man. Make, let him know that, that, you, that you're happy. Be ha if Hopefully you are happy because... Uh, if you're not happy, I'm going to say this to the brother. The goodness and the greatness of a man is heavily determined by the size of the smile of the woman that's with him's face. <laughs> if you want to know how good you're doing and how great you are as a man, look at the size of the smile of your woman. <laughs> if she ain't smiling that much, you ain't doing too good. Then, and then, of course, sensual touch. Uh, men are more physical than women. So you have to be, as a woman, you have to know that he's more physical and give you more sensual touch. And then the P stands for, um, I believe we, we broke it down to, to represent uh, power or show, that, show him that he's powerful or that you are proud of him. Honor him, show, co compliment him. And then of course the other E is eating. What food do you feed him? You don't wanna just be as a wife, you don't wanna just be a cook, 
you don't even want to just be a chef. You want to be a food scientist mm. that knows how to study what his purpose for living is and what kind of energy output is required for him to perform successfully at what he does to make a living for you or your family. And then you figure out the balance of carbohydrates, protein, and amino acids, what fruits and vegetables go well together that give him the strength and keep his health up so that he can eat good at six o'clock on Wednesday and wake up early on Thursday, ready to go conquer the world for you. Mm -hmm. So eat. And then uh, the last is C, show compassion to that man. Men are more sensitive than they act to be. Be kind, be compassionate to him, speak to him in a, in a kind way and show him that you care. And last, the T, train your children to love their father mm. show your train your children to know that what the father is out there doing because you know as a general rule brother jeff children don't spell love l-o-v-e children spell love t-i-m-e so what they deem as love is spending time with them but when a man a black man in this world is trying to survive normally we got to work so hard that we don't have a lot of that T-I-M-E. But if you've got a wife that will train the children to love their father and let them know that he's not here, but he's out there putting in work to make sure that you have that coat, that you have those shoes on your feet, that we have something to sit down on, that we have a warm home and we have food in the refrigerator. That's his love for you. So when he comes home, as soon as you hear the keys jingle, that door open, you run to that door and you jump on your father, tell him how much you love him, and that you missed him. So that's kind of a simple little formula to love her and her respect him. And if we follow that little simple template, seven days a week, 365 days in a year, we would, we would be back at 90% of all adults married again with a near 100% success ratio, staying together, good black man with a good black woman, building a future for our people. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, those who are listening, please give Brother Nuri Muhammad a digital round of applause. Brother Nuri Muhammad, you were a blessing to all of us tonight. We appreciate you coming through. You can connect with Brother Nuri Muhammad. They got him banned on some social media, some shadow banning going on, which is super garbage. But you can understand why. You can understand why. Because if we had a million or 10 million or 100 million Brother Nuri Muhammad's in this world, our community would be a better place. You can connect with Brother Nuri Muhammad right here at NuriMuhammad.com. That is NuriMuhammad.com. Thank you all for tuning in. Brother Nuri, I want to say on camera, thank you so much. This was an honor to share this space with you tonight. I appreciate it so much. Man, thank you, Brother Jeff. And I look forward to coming back and being with you again. And um, I just challenge you to, to feel the questions that come from this from the audience and then less than a few weeks, come back. Okay, we'll yes, sir. Questions that came from the people uh, as a result of what they might have heard today. And uh, no questions, off limits. And let's have that raw conversation so we can, we can get our power base back. Yes, sir. Absolutely. For those who want to, you can send your questions to Brother Neri right here at his website or to me right here on Instagram. That is at JLighty7. That is at JLighty7 on Instagram and Twitter. I appreciate you once again, Brother Neri. Thank you all for tuning in tonight, and we will see you next time. God bless.